Boy, she's cute, Katie. Younger one, right? Yeah. She's younger than my daughter, but she's not my daughter. <laughs> You like them young, or you like them black or white, or you older? Or I just like them. <laughs> I like them all. I love women. <laughs> you don't care? No, as long as they ain't, as long as they don't stink and they're clean, you know. <laughs> Where'd you grow up? I mean, well, I grew up here till I was five or seven, actually, and then moved to Vegas, and I lived in Vegas for twenty-one years, and then. Moved all over the West Coast. What was your childhood like? Um, I had a sister that was troubled and run away all the time. And I was pretty much raised myself alone. Um, my parents were divorced, both um, sets. So my mom remarried, we moved to Vegas, and then um, she divorced him. And then, yeah, so I just pretty much spent my time alone at home. and. Uh, the mom worked two jobs and my sister was always out running away or whatever. Doing, did did you have friends up. as a kid? Yeah, yeah. You did? I had friends, yeah. Lived in apartments after we, we uh, moved out of our house. So we had plenty of friends there. How far did you go in school? I made it to 11th grade before I just, I, can, uh, I went to night school because I was pouring concrete during the day because I had my own place, so I had to work, so. It got too hard. You left home early. Yeah. Well, my mom, when I was 15, said rent's due on the 5th. If you want a place to live, you might want to pay it. I'm, I'm, I'm moving to your sister. So <laughs> and that was that. So my drug dealer became, uh, took over my mom's room and <laughs> then we paid the rent. So drugs have been a part of your life? Oh, yeah. Since when? Since, Since high school. about 13. Mm -hmm. It was weed and then... Um, LSD, um, mushrooms, um, crank. Back then it was crank. It wasn't meth, it was crank. And then um, I loved LSD and mushrooms, <laughs> but I'd only done them maybe 20 times in my life. Mm -hmm. Being 50, that's not too bad. But, but I, love, I love the hallucinations. <laughs> what, what is your drug now? My drug now is crack. Crack. And, and still weed. I still smoke weed too. Yeah. And you like to go to Figueroa Street? Yep, I was there last night. <laughs> but actually, I live in Anaheim, so I go to Garden Grove. This girl's there, too? Yeah, yeah, but she's out here right now, so we go, when I come out here to take her to her, to her tricks, then, I, you know, we go local. <laughs> and how, how, how many years have you been coming here? Oh, about 10. It hasn't gotten any better. <laughs> is it a problem for you, or is it, is it just something you enjoy doing? Well, it's a problem that I enjoy doing. <laughs> How often do you go? Every day. Every day? Every day. That's a problem. Crack is a problem, you know, because it is, gets is, you. Is crack part of the equation? It is, there. Yeah, it's the biggest problem. Yeah. If you weren't smoking crack, you probably wouldn't be coming to... Hell no. <laughs> Unless I was doing a job here, because I do print, I do architectural millwork installation, so, you know, I do all the high-rises and stuff like that. So crack is, is the core of your issue. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's why I'm not working now. <laughs> mm. and how that's why I don't have my kid. That's why I don't have my life. That's why I'm living in my van. That's <laughs> oh, you're living in a van? Yes. You were married before? No. Never married, but you have, no. you have a child? Somehow I pick up on women that have a husband and a boyfriend, and they're leaving both of them. And, and I can't trust a woman like that to marry her. <laughs> and then I get them pregnant, and then... And then they leave and life goes on. What have, you, what have you learned from this life you're living? That I fucked up big time by taking that first hit of crack. Is that what kind of derailed your life? The, it ruined everything. Had I not done that, I'd have probably been a lawyer instead of a cabinet maker with a blown back, <laughs> smoking crack every day. Lost his job two years ago now. Two years now, haven't worked. And hanging out with prostitutes. Well, yeah. Well, six months ago, I was in rehab, and I made it a whole month after that. <laughs> but after I got out of the uh, sober living, I had no place to go. And um, I did it all for, to get my kid, and the judge didn't 
didn't recognize any of it. All she recognized was the visits I did. So I didn't get custody of them. I didn't get anything. I just keep getting to visit them. So I said, fuck it. I got high. I just wanted to. You know, it wasn't any other reason. I just wanted to. <laughs> and I knew the consequences. Anybody with half a brain knows consequences, but. And when, you know. you're, when you're smoking and you're, let's say Figueroa Street, you're there all night or you're. Oh, I just, I grab it and then I get in my van and take off. Try to find, try to find a hooker to hook up with or something. You know? And you'll spend just a quickie or you spend hours with her? Oh, the whole night. The whole night. Until it's gone. <laughs> and then we'll go get some more. <laughs> so you, you need a girl who smokes crack. Yeah. You have to go further up. You have to go higher up on, on Figaro Street. Well, no, I got my girls, you know. I yeah, got the, they're, they're my bread and butter. Shit, that's, they're all I need. They get me high all day. Closer to Century Boulevard is where you, you know, find those girls. Yeah. But, you know, all I got to do is, is take her around and she'll get me high all day and night. Red, red pays good. <laughs> she pays really well. Pays gas and dope. And food. But I don't eat much, so. <laughs> Have you been in love before? Yes. I've been in love many times. But I didn't know how to handle it because I wasn't equipped. Like I said, I raised myself and I did a very terrible job because I had no direction, so. You think it was the poor parenting that... Yeah, I didn't have parents, you know. Mom tried her best, but she had to work two jobs, so. And she was an alcoholic, so, you know, when she was home, when she was done working, she went gambling, and then she came home, and she'd have a couple drinks with us because we'd be playing quarters or something, you know, a bunch of kids partying, and then she, we'd get her two beers. She'd get drunk and go to her bed, and then we'd take off and go to the mountains or something, you know, so. <laughs> yeah, that was my parenting. <laughs> What's your favorite memory from your life? Going to Cancun with my dad. Hmm. How old were you? 15. Right before I started smoking crack. <laughs> <laughs> right before? Yeah. What are you proudest of in your life? My children. You, you, still, you still see them? Yeah. Yeah, I stay by their house usually. I'll stay in their, like, their driveway or their... Or, um, their parking lot or something because I have one of my sons lives in Orange he rents a room in the house the other one lives on um, in Anaheim and rents an apartment so usually I'll take the younger one who lives in Orange over to his brothers every day and then like I'll take off or something sometimes I go without a few days I try to go as long as I can because I'm trying to quit I really am but I'm an addict <laughs> it's hard to quit it's hard what is this lifestyle, living in your van, drug addicted, stuff like that? What, what does that do to your self-worth, your self-esteem? Oh, I don't have any of that. <laughs> I, uh, uh, two years ago, I walked off the job <laughs> like this, and I've never done that in my life. But I was fucking up everything I touched. And uh, the number one guy came to me and says, look, you know, we can't leave you. What's up with you? He goes, I want to I want to I want to say something, but I'm going to give you the chance to say whatever's going on with you. So I said, him, okay, I've been smoking crack. And then, then the boss came up so, and with a new guy, so I figured that was my replacement. So I worked in my car and sat there for 45 minutes, and then I went home. And I turned my phone on about six hours later, and there was a bunch of messages from the boss wondering if I was okay. <laughs> and he would have took me back, except I had him take me to rehab, and then I left a week after right after I got a detox because the girl that I was with, uh, my last baby mama, she went in two days later and it was just a nightmare. She was flirting with guys and stuff and she ended up coming to my room when I moved over with one of the guys that was uh, hitting on her. She didn't know I was his roommate. <laughs> so that's when I left. I'm like, fuck this. Is that when you... And then the boss like lost it for me. He had no, he wasn't going to take me back after that because he paid for my thousand dollar deductible to go there, <laughs> you know, and he said, if you complete it, I'll take you back. And I didn't. <laughs> Is it because the drug becomes your coping mechanism that you relapse so easily? Like yeah. You never learned any other way to cope with Right. Losing a girlfriend or, or whatever. Yeah. I, 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 getting high is my escape, you know. That's how I forget all my problems and I can just forget everything, you know. That's the common. <laughs> That's what anybody will say, right? Yeah. 
that's my escape. It helps me forget all the pain and the troubles and it helps create the, it helps enforce what I'm feeling. <laughs> it's an oxymoron, but, yeah. but addiction is real. What, what do you think most people don't understand about drug addiction? Anything. You'd have to be one to understand it, so I'd, I suggest they don't. Because from an outsider's view, the behavior seems so insane. Yeah. Even when I, when I sober up and I see people like that, I'm like, gosh, I'm so glad I don't do that no more. And then two weeks later, <laughs> there I am. So it's hard to judge. It's hard to judge people. I don't judge anybody anymore because I'm like the lowest on the totem pole, you know, in my eyes. I said, my proudest thing is my children because they're, they're better than me. They smoke weed, but that's it. You know, they experimented with other drugs, but they don't do it. You know. be careful. They're, they're a lot smarter. They're, well, they see what I was like, so maybe that was enough. Because when my parents, in my eyes, they were drunk, so I didn't, I didn't drink. I don't drink. Yeah, but so I'm a drug addict. Yeah, way better plan. <laughs> I was such a worse parent than my parents were. <laughs> I stuck with my relationship because my dad left when I was five, so and he didn't say goodbye or nothing. So, and um, I, I'm okay with that, but I, I wasn't okay with doing that to my kids. And then when my dad died, before he died, he said he had no regrets, and I'm like, not one. And he said, no, I'm like, fuck, maybe that was a smart idea. He he had a good life. He had a sugar mama. He went. He lived a good life. He had no regrets. So obviously he didn't want kids, so maybe that was the best thing for him. What's your biggest fear now? My daughter. <laughs> she proved herself in life. <laughs> I got a redheaded stepchild. <laughs> I got with my first baby mama when she, we were old uh, high school lovers, right? And then she came back when she was 27 with a kid from, from Seattle. And um, I got with her. She left her husband and us. So then I got with her. And then we moved back to Seattle and had another kid or two more kids. And so her daughter is redhead. And she was just, I'm like, that was a deal breaker when I met her. I'm like, oh, my God, this kid is going to be too much. And my boss always told me that you never take a girl with kids who smokes and lives with their parents. <laughs> and she did all those. <laughs> so, and so, but I, she was like the best lay I ever had. So, <laughs> so I took her back and then about a month into our relationship, I got her pregnant and I didn't like her. So I came home to kick her out and she told me she was pregnant. So right then and there, I dumped my other girl and said, you know, I'm stuck with that. I'm like, I'm gonna be responsible and do the right thing and stick to it and be a family man. You know, so, and I sucked at it. <laughs> but at least my kids got validation for how they were raised. I validated them, told them however you feel, how, whatever you remember is okay. I said, and I apologize to them. I said, I'm just, I wasn't equipped, you know. <laughs> and now they respect me again, so. How much do you spend on crack? Everything. Everything you got? Oh, yeah. But I don't steal and I don't suck dick. <laughs> and when you're smoking, a, a girl to smoke with just makes the party complete. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, because they like to get naked and you can have sex. And if you ever had an orgasm when you take a hit, that's the best feeling ever. That's what the addiction is. <laughs> And you have regulars that you'll go to, or do you have different girls that? I have about five girls, uh, I see. And they all smoke with you? No, no, not all of them. One of them's my baby, my last baby mama. She's completely clean, and she thinks I am too. So, but I, I'm, we haven't been together in a couple months. And then the rest of them either do meth or crack. Where do you think you'll be in five years? Dead. I don't think it'll take that long either. <laughs> a lot of people that smoke crack will end up finding some crack that has fentanyl in it. Matter of fact, I did die off it once. I bought an eight ball of Coke from a cartel dude that I'd been buying for, from for a while. And I bought his last eight ball and I went and cooked it up 
usually I go and cook it up and then I'll go in my car and smoke it. But this time I just stayed in a hotel with my friends and I cooked it up and I was going to leave. I'm like, no, I'm going to take a hit. And I took a hit and before I could pass him the pipe, I died. <laughs> and it took six Narcans and six cops and six paramedics to revive me. And it still took me like six hours to come out of it. Just off one little hit. And it wasn't even that good of a hit. And that didn't stop me either. So, well, once you die, what else you got to fear, right? <laughs> and that's the, I found out that's the way to go. If you're going to die, man, fetty out because you don't know it. As soon as you let that shit out, you're dead. You're gone. And you don't know nothing. You don't feel nothing. That's the most humane way to die. So, I don't know. I always thought, you know, you think, how do you want to die? And you don't think there's any way you could die that you don't suffer. This way you don't. You don't suffer, you don't even know it. Which makes me wonder what happens to your soul. Because if you don't know you're dying, <laughs> maybe you go to limbo or something. So maybe it's not the way. So we're not going to impose on that. <laughs> and Charles, what, what would you say is the most important lesson you've learned in your life? Listen to your parents. Have a big heart. And don't let anybody take you from you. Because you're all you got in this world. That's great. All right, Charles, thank you so much for sharing your story. Thank you. I wish you lots of luck. Thank you.